I'm, I'm fascinated by a whole range of different things, including architecture, although as a layman, I don't really understand it. So excuse my ignorance, but I try and dabble a little bit in architecture, and I'm completely off the mark. Um, my talk tonight is about something I'm really passionate about. My label is about celebrating Africa. I'm very passionate about Africa. And I think that we in a place now where we can finally unleash the potential of our continent. And that's why I call this talk Afro-Optimism, about um, navigating a new world order. And um, just a little background in terms of what's happening in the world. I mean, if you, the UN, um, a whole range of governments and international organizations are looking at Africa in a whole new way. And a recent study, um, was talking about the three mega trends that are emerging in Africa. Um, we know a lot of this anyway, um, about the high demand for natural resources, large scale investments in the continent, um, increased consumerism by an emerging African middle class. That's how the world is starting to see us. I think what's really interesting as well is by 2050, when the world's population is 9 billion, Africa is going to have a population of 2 billion. Now, in the context of that, Europe and the rest of the developed world at that stage in 2050 is only going to be sitting at about 1 billion people. So, Africa as a continent would have doubled their population compared to what we think of now as the most important economies in the world. And more importantly, two out of three sub Saharan people, two, two out of three sub-Saharans will be less, are less than 25 years old today. So with the doubt, without a doubt, they're going to be the future consumers for the economy and for the world. Um, interesting. <laughs> we love drinking. Um, we had champagne today, and what I find very fascinating is like a recent study was looking at champagne consumption around the world. And would you believe that Nigeria is now one of the fastest growing consumers of champagne in the world? They're just behind France in terms of champagne consumption. Um, they're ahead of Brazil, China, the US, Australia. In fact, according to a recent study, in 2011, Nigerians spent almost 8 billion naira. That's 497 million rand on champagne. <laughs> Last year, they spent 584 million rand on champagne. Um, so it's a little wonder then, in terms of this growing consumer culture that's happening in Africa, that the rest of the world is starting to look at Africa in a different way. Um, that was a cover of Uma Vogue in Italy, one of the most powerful fashion magazines in the world, and they did an entire issue covering Africa. They used Lira, one of the most amazing singers in the country, in from South Africa. They featured her in that issue. Um, and I think what's really interesting when it comes to fashion is that Africa is playing a really strong role in terms of driving trends. Um, there's a sense in terms of fashion, what I call new tribalism, where pattern making and um, the silhouettes from Africa is becoming very strong design trends. Um, you can see it in a whole range of different ways. Um, this was a collection from one of the biggest designers in the US, John and Karen, which they drew inspiration from the Massa Warriors. Um, Burberry, one of the strongest heritage brands in the UK, that's like 185 years old, um, used detailing, which for me is undeniably inspired by Africa and artisanal skills from Africa. This is a collection from a designer in America called Michael Kors. And Michael Kors actually, um, I'll play this video where he talks about his inspiration. Sound. 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 I think it's 
What it also though becomes is a challenge about our existence and how do we find a way of cohabiting, especially in an open space, how do we reflect our own personality? And I think what's really exciting is how there's certain groups, like this group in Johannesburg called the Wire A, they've started growing these urban gardens on top of buildings. They're using, they're recycling whatever they find. So old tires become um, bars of spinach to plant, lettuces or spinach. Um, and what's great is it's, it's helping with the urban inner city renewal. And it's also sharing and passing on skills to other people. Um, the YA has um, transferred skills to about 100 people from local communities who are now learning how to farm, um, plant their own vegetables and top of rooftops. I'm really interested in people who think about the future. And one of the most amazing people I was blessed with meeting a couple of years ago was um, this product designer from Paris called Matthias Lehanna. And he said to me, design can improve my way of living, my way of sleeping, my way of breathing, my way of thinking, of loving. And he, he looks at that in everything he designs. And when we talk about finding solutions for urban spaces, um, Marcus came up with a really interesting idea, um, which he won an award in 2008, um, the Best Innovation Award from the US, for an air filtration system called Andrea. Now, I don't know how many of you guys know um, the movie Little Shop of Horrors, but Andrea was the plot that just kept growing and kept eating people around. And he drew inspiration from that. And he, he says um, you, he, he gets a lot of information from a whole range of different sources. He thinks information is the key for innovation. Um, and one of the things he came across was a study from NASA, which found that astronauts returning from space had a high level of toxic compounds in their system as a result of um, being exposed to all the plastic, fiberglass, insulating materials, and the deterrents, which was slowly poisoning them as they were in the capsule in space. Um, he also told me that he found out that there's more pollution inside, indoors, than there is outside. So Andrea, as the filtration system, is a solution to kind of cope with that pollution problem. And it's and actually, it's a very beautiful way of looking at a filtration system. It's about utilizing plants that clean the air and encasing it in a shape which said to me, it's like, kind of almost like a dog that you can pat. You can put it on your desk and like, you know, just pat it a little bit. And he created this design, almost like the oak cut out of a brain, so you can almost see the brain at the top. And so that you can feel quite strongly about how this plant is helping make your, your place more breathable. It is a bit way out, but actually a bit more way out is this design of his, um, which is called Local River. And Local River is a home storage unit, but it's more than a home storage unit. Um, there's a group of people, a community in San Francisco, who started emerging in about 2005. They call the Lockables. I don't know if any of you guys heard about them. But the Lockables um, started changing their consciousness about how you exist in the environment. And they believe, and the manner in which they live is everything they consume has to be found within 106 kilometers from where they live. In that way, it produces carbon footprints. In that way, it doesn't harm the great environment. And it's a manner of way of going back to the way things used to be about existing with nature. And, and he took that idea and said, you don't need to only bring home, bring nature home as decoration, it can serve as a purpose to give you food. So the local river home storage unit, if you can look in the picture, is eels and there's fish in the water at the bottom, which you 
in his world, you like when you need something to eat, you go go to your home store and she knows to fish out a fish that she can cook. Or if you need some herbs or vegetables, you can cut them out of the glass container in your living room. So sorry, Woolworths. It looks like if Mateus is the Hannah's world textbook, we won't need supermarkets. That's a way of looking at how we can exist in the own environment. How else can desire create a better world? I mean, I always look at um, things and wonder why well, was the desire like that all the time? We talk about solar panels and RPP houses and that they are going to solve solutions about energy, but is it the most sleek desire out there? <laughs> I hope one of you guys can figure that out and kind of make solar panels a little bit more sexy in terms of incorporating them into homes. Um, I, I really believe that design initiatives need to be focused in nature and systematic in scope. And for me, kind of, maybe the solar panels are focused on a purpose, but they're not systematic. Um, which came to a little thing that I think about which is about cups of coffee. And we all have, I actually stopped drinking coffee about two years ago, but I know the fix about having a cup of coffee. And when you think about coffee, there's one company globally that you think of, and that's Starbucks. Starbucks is so successful that globally they sell about like four billion cups of beverage a year. That's what people consume. But what does that mean? It actually means that there's lots of Starbucks cups becoming landfill in the world today. If you consume four billion cups of coffee, that's four billion cups a year. Which is a problem that Starbucks are thinking about, thinking how can we solve this? Because we don't want to start associating with creating landfill. We want to make feel, people feel good about coffee. Um, so they came up with a program, which they said it's quite ambitious, that to make 100% of the cups reusable and recyclable by 2015. Apparently they are attached with that, and what they did was they have cup summits. How's that? <laughs> we have summits for a whole range of different things. Government loves having summits. Well, Starbucks had three cup summits to solve the solution about the four billion plastic cups that they're producing and people consuming every year. But it's quite interesting because they looked at this whole thing really holistically. Um, they summits in 2009, 2010, 2011, where they brought together a whole range of different people. They brought together government officials, raw material suppliers, cup manufacturers, retail, beverage businesses, a whole range of different people to talk about how we can reduce our cups. And I think it's really interesting. That was, I um, listened to one of the talks today, it was about um, partnerships. I think Andrew Bray from the Cape Town, um, Cape Town Partnership. Cape Town Partnership. It was talking about people need to come together. Um, we can't operate in silos, we need to work together to come up with solutions. And so they did. They brought all these people together, and one of the first things they did was come up with recycling bins at Starbucks stores. Um, but then they realized that actually, um, that they first thought that the cup material was the key contributor to recyclability. But then they realized that they needed to look at the entire value chain. Because you can try and recycle the cup, but where does the recycled material go to? And then who's going to produce the recycled material? So you so they said they looked at the entire chain and they started helping um, look at looking at the recycled infrastructure, commercial markets, um, and one of the solutions they came up with was at the second cup of summit. They, they did a pilot project where they recycled the cups, not only into new cups, but they recycled those cups into napkins 
which they gave to consumers at their stores, which is a great way of looking at that. I mean, it's like we would have thought about the car would become a natural. Um, and the third side, they actually took all that intel and brought in other people who were also producing um, disposable food packaging and used their experience as pilot studies to help bring the entire industry on board to solve the problem about disposable waste that comes from fast food, from coffee. So my thing is, if you can do that with a cup, what can you do with a brick? I don't know, maybe that's something for you guys to think about. Um, when we talk about trends, there's something really interesting happening in the world as well, and that's this is really interesting for me. It's called backshore. And that gave me the opportunity to use a picture of Port Elizabeth there <laughs> to think how I'm going to tell what backshore is. But backshore is a really interesting. I don't know how many of you guys have heard about backshore, but my talk was asked to speak about globalization. Actually, backshore is a reaction to globalization. Um, the, the environment's changing globally. And think about this. In 2003, China's factory worker earned 62 cents an hour. Five years later, their salaries more, more than doubled. They now earn, well, in 2008, they were earning $1.36. So the whole idea about cheap labor coming from Asia is no longer the case because as the Chinese economy keeps growing, people start earning more money. And we have to, you have to start thinking about solutions. You can't think about getting cheap imports from the rest of the world. Um, quick response is one of the key elements which manufacturing is using. Actually, plants, automotive plants, especially the automotive plants around the world, including like your Volkswagen or Ford in Port Elizabeth, use a quick response system in terms of, of uh, it's called the Mighty Manufacturing Minute, in terms of assembling cars. And backshoring uses that as an element to kind of start looking at how people can produce more. And so taking the finance cost of labor and making it less by getting people to produce more. Um, it's because there's a reaction against um, imports. It's also because of the fact that it takes so long for an import to come from the rest of the world. But what's also important is um, the millennials, who are the new generation, who are the Twitter freaks, who are on Facebook, who have short attention span, who are um, consumers to please are no longer just happy with getting something that comes with a conveyor belt. They want a story, they want something that can relate to them, they can talk to them. And so backshoring is a way of like giving, producing items which can have a bit more of a soul. This is, I just wanted to use this as well as an example because you know, we think about Apple, and we think about Apple as like this warm and fuzzy company, but they've had to face a whole lot of challenges, especially over the past few years when it comes to um, labor issues in Asia. Um, they've been accused of child labor, 24 hour working days, unsafe working conditions. Um, so this is a company that everyone thinks can do no wrong, and now they're thinking, how are we gonna solve this? Solution. Um, so what did they do? They came up with changing the entire identity and brought out, before they used to have operating systems called Snow Leopard and Lion, that sort of thing. And um, the last operating system they brought out, OS X, they called Mavericks. And why did they do that? They speak about Mavericks being like kind of a, because they run out of animals, so they had to think of something else, and they went back to where they come from, and Mavericks is a big surfing site in California. And their branding has all been about design by Apple in California. I think that's really hard because it's still made in Asia, but it's designed in California. <laughs> and I think 
using that as a concept is really powerful. Um, in Port Elizabeth, where you come from, finding a way of branding who you are could be the solution to merging your industry. Um, because I know about fashion, I thought, well, I have to talk about fashion a little bit, because I know I've spoken about champagne, I've spoken about coffee, um, spoken about fishing out of your living room, but fashion. And fashion, fashion has proven to be a very good solution for allowing companies to think about their process in a different way. And one of the biggest drivers in fashion at the moment has been fast fashion. Um, fast fashion is proving that design can resurrect local industries, which is a crazy idea because when you think about clothing, you think most of it's made in Asia. And then you look at a company called Zara, where most of the garments are not made in Asia, it's made in Spain or it's made in Turkey. And, why, and they're the biggest fashion retailer in the world. Um, Ortega, the owner, is the richest man in Europe. Um, and it's, for me, it's 1975 is when Zara was created. It's now the world's biggest fashion retailer by sales, operates in 1,763 um, 1, shops in 86 countries. Um, Opening South Africa in November 2011 and opens in Port Elizabeth, I think, next month. <laughs> 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 it's quite interesting. I spoke to an economist um, a, few, a couple of years ago when Zara opened in, in um, San Francisco and he was saying just based on this square meterage, they're making about 200 million rand a year just to make San Francisco alone. So that gives you a little bit of an insight about why they're here. They come in here because there's a market. Um, they produce 10,000 new stocks a year. While the industry average used to be in terms of when you roll out clothing into the stores, it would take about six months to do that, Zara rolls out a new store, a new style into the store in two weeks. Um, very interesting for me was that local manufacturers, local retailers, have looked at that model and have started adopting it. Um, for Sheen, for instance, um, in Cape Town, uh, Martin Mendelssohn, who's the retail director of the Fashini Group, um, said, as a retailer, my ability to react to trends needed to be faster, simply. So what do they do? For the first time in over 20 years, Fushimi actually bought a factory about two years ago. They are now employ a local workforce. Um, they have turned their business around. It now takes 10 working days from the time fabric arrives to the time garments are completed and ready for dispatch at their factory. Um, they, the factory called Prestige Clothing, which is the factory that Fushimi bought in Woodstock in Cape Town, takes 6.2 minutes to produce the t-shirts. Um, they talk about 56 days as they turn around time, and the 56 days might sound like a long time, but it's actually, that's from the concept of creating a new garment to sampling it, to producing it in the factory, to delivering it to the hundreds of stores around the country. So fast fashion is here, and it's not just Zara that's doing this, we've got local manufacturers, local retailers doing this. And they've managed to now up their offering that 40% of their local stock is made in South Africa. Obviously they need a building to show what they do, and they had a new building design by um, architects in Cape Town called RBA. Um, to, this is a new design centre which has state-of-the-art technology um, which all the designers use in terms of creating um, the garments that arrive in stores. I'll play another video and hopefully this one, the sound works, maybe it won't. 
Someone's killing watch to the year before. <laughs> okay, you know what? I, I can talk through this. Um, artisanal skills are really important because it becomes a differentiating point. And I think Louis Vuitton is the world's biggest luxury brand. And, and what they started doing is they realized that they grew so big that they've actually had to shut down stores in China. They've been closing down stores and they've been re looking at their merchandise and decided we're not going to do anything unless it's general leather. And we're going to concentrate on artisanal skills of our manufacturer, our art process, that actually their bags and materials, things that they're going to be producing, is actually going to be a lot more expensive because they're concentrating on the fact that it's made in Europe, it's made by artisans from time honored traditions in workshops in Italy, in Paris. And it's, it's their point of difference. And for me, as an African, we've got so many amazing artisanal skills in our country. Um, the way I met Debbie a few months ago was I was working with the crafters in the Eastern Cape on helping teach them how to produce, take their traditional skills and channeling that into new um, interpreting trends, playing with different colours, um, cleaning up the aesthetic. And I think the same way Louis Vuitton uses their arsenal skills and talks about these handcrafted wallets that people pay thousands of dollars for, we've got a whole mass of people in our country who have these amazing skills that we should be helping to nurture and unleash as well. Okay. This is just my little example. We were saying, why have I not spoken about what like, she's like, I hope you talk about your designs and stuff. And I was like, no, it wasn't really about that. But um, one of the projects I've been working on um, is actually got to do with the scopes. It's a Buru goat, which I'd never heard of until I started working on this project in 2007. And apparently it's a goat that's quite prevalent around the Eastern Cape. Um, and I met an amazing, amazing professor at the CSIR in Port Elizabeth called Dr. Anton Porter. And he helped develop um, what we're calling African cashmere. And this is one of the garments from my most recent collection that I um, showcased a couple of weeks ago. Um, but cashmere comes, you can produce the fibers of cashmere from goats that people are using and herding around in the Eastern Cape, um, which the CSR did the tests and figured out how to turn that yarn, that, um, the wool from the goats into yarn, which um, I placed that I've got like an international distributor who's very keen to use my garments using African cashmere um, to try and see if we can sell it overseas. So there's opportunities right here in our doorstep. I think also when it comes to architects, I don't know how many local architects, I don't, I don't know many. I mean, I've been blessed with having to meet a few. Um, including Joe Nero, who I think is a visionary. But I think the design world, in fashion, people know who designers are, but how many local architects do we know? And I think um, for architecture to grow to another level, we need to start promoting ourselves, and that's why I think opportunities like tonight, where people are acknowledged for what they've done, is a great starting point. But there has to be more. Um, David Roger is um, a Ghanaian British architect who has become one of the world's most well known and recognized architects. Um, he's just, but in 2015, he's going to be, um, the building he designed, um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, will be opening. And if you just Google him, is, he's on so many lists. He's like, you know, um, the one list is the most powerful um, British guy, a British person in, in the arts. Um, so he's managed to, to use 
and the ethos of what he does and the manner in which he um, designs buildings, around him. Um, Knoll, one of the most biggest Italian furniture companies, just commissioned, commissioned him to design his little chairs. And he said, he said this once, that Africa is an extraordinary opportunity. What is amazing is that, unlike working in Europe or America at the moment, as an architect in Africa, you can ascribe to a new paradigm. And I think that's, for me, really powerful. And going back to what I was talking about, the positivity of Africa and the opportunities here, I think that um, in terms of globalization and trends, we don't actually have to look at the rest of the world. All we should do is look in our backyard and find ways of exploring that and celebrating that. And that's all I have to say. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.